Welcome back to Just Silla. We are on episode 10. Episode 10. This is huge. It's a milestone. We've made it to the double digits. I couldn't do it without you. And I certainly couldn't do it without my amazing, amazing team, um, including one special woman who I have back to do this podcast because her life is really fascinating. She's a journalist. She's a community leader. She is a friend. She is dynamic. She helps me grow. And I love women around me who are that way. So welcome, Trish Muiko Tobin. Thank you so much. And thank you for all those adjectives. <laughs> you make me sound pretty impressive. You are pretty. You are really, really impressive. Well, thank you. And I'm excited because people will get to see that in your upcoming podcast. That's right. We are going to launch a podcast because you are a journalist, but you're also a woman. Yes. You also care about issues. Yes. You also particularly care about immigrant stories. Of course. Just like your story and my story. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. And it's a part of you that people know a little bit of if they're in our community, but not a lot of to get to know who you are as a person behind the woman. And so I want you to share your life. How did you end up in America from the Philippines? Oh, boy. Well, that is a long, complicated story, as yours is, and I am familiar with your story. But long story short, um, my parents have always wanted this life for us. When I was born, my parents were already deciding to go to the United States just because of the opportunities um, that this country offered. So when I was born, my mom worked as a chemical engineer. My dad was a businessman slash entrepreneur. And um, they actually hired a nanny specifically because she spoke English. Uh, they were so sure that after my birth, we were going to come to the United States. And so I actually learned to speak English before I spoke Tagalog, which is the native language of the Philippines. And, um, but then martial law came. Ferdinand Marcos um, declared martial law on the country so nobody could leave. And so, um, you know, my parents had another child, my brother Tony II, and, um, and then they had another child, my brother Tony III. My dad, <laughs> my dad was in love with his name. It worked out. Um, so... When my second brother was born, martial law had been lifted. So we were on track to come to the United States once again. And How so old were you at that point? At that point, I was in my pre-teens. And we came to the United States um, as a family of five in 1985, and I was 13. And if I remember correctly, it was not that you got on a flight and came to the United States and landed in the United States. There was turmoil around your leaving. And I think that's a very fascinating part of your life story. Do you mind sharing? Oh, not at all. About that? Um, well, so right around the time that we were getting ready to leave again, uh, after my second brother was born, um, Senator Benigno Aquino, who was in exile in the U.S., came back to the Philippines. And upon arrival, he was assassinated. And there's still a big mystery as to who was actually responsible. But he represented the opposition to the government. Um, so a lot of the Filipinos back in the day saw him as, as their hope, their hope against the dictator, Marcos. So when that happened, I believe that was a huge turning point in the history of the Philippines. And so my dad was one of those people who really saw that hope in Senator Aquino. And so when he was assassinated, the trajectory of my dad's life changed. And he pretty much divested all of his business um, assets and focused on becoming an opposition leader. And so um, it wasn't rare at all for 
a TV crew or a reporter to be in our home interviewing my father just because that was our life. You know, my mom worked her full-time job as a chemical engineer, Mm -hmm. and my dad was at home kind of manning, you know, um, base of operation for the opposition. And during that time... You had secu- you had you were being tracked as a family during this tumultuous time. Correct, because um, my dad, of course, you know, he was a spokesman for one or two of the opposition groups, and so he would be the talking head you saw on TV, and so he was very um, identifiable as an enemy of the government. So we learned that he was put on the the list the blacklist. And um, also at the time when my dad was doing all that, he started a newspaper called the Manila Hotline. And at the time it was considered a subversive newspaper because it the stories that you see above the fold are just, you wouldn't see it here. Mm-hmm. Um, stories of victims of the government, beheadings, Things like that were going on then. So he was showing the world what was really happening. He was showing the world what was happening. And so, and then right after that, he started a radio program called the Manila Hotline. So bringing the newspaper to life and taking calls from uh, family members of victims who are no longer around to speak about their experiences. So um, pretty soon he started noticing that there were men in dark suits and sunglasses following him wherever he went. And my dad being my dad, he had to say something on the air about it and kind of taunt these people who are following him. Mm -hmm. And of course what happened after that is those guys started following the rest of the family around. So we would be going to church, we would be going to the mall, and we'd turn around, and there they are. So what was the day like, the day that you left? Was everything planned? Yes, everything was planned. I mean, we had known for a while. I think we had known for a few months. But to us, it was like a drill, because it had happened before, like within that past year, that we thought we were going to be able to leave, and we didn't. Um, So we kind of had a game plan. Um, But when we left, it was just me, my mom, and the second, or the first brother, Tony the second. Your father stayed. My father stayed with Tony the third to, you know, take care of the house, take care of other business, and they followed about a few months later. So you get to the United States. It's a totally different country from the Philippines, the you know, you're coming from a place that was very restricted, and then you come to America. What happened here? Well, so my very first, so we came in August of 85. And so it was a quick turnaround. And immediately, I found myself in Mr. Seitz's eighth grade class at St. Simon's. And um, my very first distinct observation was that you didn't have to raise your hand to talk. And that shocked me. I had the kids, my classmates around me, and they would just say what they wanted to say. And I think it's still like that. It's still like that. That is a very interesting observation because in the schools that I attended too, you had to put your hand up to say anything. And be called. Mm. So I was appalled when the teacher would ask a question, what do you think of this? And somebody would just say what they thought. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so I think I spent the first few weeks of eighth grade just kind of looking around at who are these people? Mm. Who do they think they are? But it was actually me who was different. Yeah, so it was <laughs> the cultural differences being yes. really... Um, that really stuck in my mind. <laughs> and then fast forward a little bit, you ended up at Mizzou. Yes. And now you are away from the rest of your family who you shared similar things with. What was college like for you? So Mizzou was decided upon based on the proximity. They didn't want me too far. And also because I wanted to be a journalist. Um, I grew up around that. So it wasn't unusual um, to, to be around reporters and cameras because I grew up seeing my dad do that. And I think that is where part of the fascination with just 
always being in the know comes from. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be that person, and I get offended when I hear about news that somebody else is telling me about. Mm. And I'm looking at them. How dare you? <laughs> I'm Tell the same. me instead of me <laughs> telling you, you know. Um, yeah. And so Mizzou was, I'd like to say liberating, but not really, because you're still functioning as you. So you mm. give yourself the checks. But you went a little wild there for a little bit. Who told you that? <laughs> um, I've seen some of your pictures. They look a little wild. <laughs> well, you know. The drinking, really, you couldn't avoid. It was oh around you. Oh, my God. I didn't even know that part. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I drank, mm -hmm. but I wasn't like some of my friends were that that was all they did. But you already felt like a rebel for drinking when you're underage. So one drink is like, oh, my God, I can't believe I just did that. Mm -hmm. And just the fact that, um, you know, I went to an all-girls high school. My only co-ed experience in school prior to that was eighth grade at St. Simon's. So that was different to all of a sudden have guys in the mix. Freedom. Freedom like that where they're around you and they would hang out with us at our dorm and we would eat with them. We would go out with them. It was just unheard of because you're talking to somebody who had a 10 o'clock curfew throughout high school Oh, my God. And never was allowed to spend the night at anybody's house. So you get to Mizzou and you're dating and you meet Dave. Was Dave the first serious guy you dated? Was he the first white guy because you come from a different background? Correct. Well, you know, Dave, looking back now, he was the first serious guy. You know, when you think about it in that way, I ended up marrying him. But um, again, when you're at that age, when you're in your early 20s, late teens, you think every relationship that you have is a serious oh, yeah. relationship. Yes. So no, Dave was not the first white guy I dated or, or you know, had as a boyfriend. Because really growing up, uh, being a high school student in St. Louis, mm -hmm. that's pretty much all I was exposed to. It was uh, predominantly white. Um, not that I'm complaining, but those were the guys I hang out with. So you 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 were used to it. It was just what Correct. you did. So my dates, my prom dates, dance dates, they were white boys. Did you explore a little bit at Mizzou? <laughs> <laughs> Not at Mizzou. Before Mizzou, um, right at senior year of high school, when I was at Koryezu Academy, I met Alan. Um he and I both worked at the mall, at South County Mall. Do you remember that clothing store? Is it JW? No, no. I probably oh, wasn't here yet. You Probably not, but yeah. it was a totally 80s store for men where you would find those really tight jackets that cut off at the waist. <laughs> and then I know the really exactly baggy what you're pants. talking about. Okay, yes. so that 80s look. So he worked there, and I worked at Fannie Mae Candies. Mm. So we met each other. He was a couple of years older than me. Um, he is African-American. And we hit it off. We hit it off. And now, again, that I'm being asked about my past, yes, it makes me think, was it something that I did because I wanted to be a rebel? Mm. Or was it some? I mean, I, I truly cared for him. I mean, I liked him. He was fun to hang out with. But again, you know, I was young and my parents were not happy. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. That they were, was first, too they much. They were surprised, you know. Yeah. But was that something you were thinking about as you were thinking about dating him? Well, of course, because that's your first impression. Oh, my God, he's a very cool, handsome black guy. Mm -hmm. Not that you're thinking that as you meet them because you're attracted to the personality and you're attracted to the fact that you get along really well and you can laugh with them and, and be with them and have fun. But then that starts to sink in, you know, and then you're thinking, oh, my gosh, what's my family going to think? Of course, all my friends thought it was cool. Mm, yes. You know, because we were that couple at the prom. I took him to prom. We were that couple. I remember one distinct moment where 
it was one of those things you see in the movies, like the floor clearing dance. Ooh. And we were in the middle of it because he was a great dancer. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, yeah. Like, I, I can't even imagine you on the dance floor <laughs> breaking it down. <laughs> I didn't have to. He was doing it for me. <laughs> that is so cool. And so during prom, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, what are the nuns thinking? What are the nuns thinking? Because mm-hmm. they were there as chaperones. Um but, you know, maybe that was just an inward dialogue with myself and nobody was thinking anything. Who knows? And then you get to Mizzou, and, of course, that relationship didn't work, and then you dated for a while. Yes. Um, going into my freshman year at Mizzou, I had a boyfriend whom I met prior to, to the first semester, and we were together for a little less than a year. Um, but, no, it did not work out. And you met Dave, the love of your life, at Mizzou. How did that happen? Oh, my goodness. So, yes, I did meet him there. I had just broken up with the boyfriend from St. Louis. And um, there was a close friend who we really got along well. We hung out, for the most part, for much of our college years up until that point. Mm -hmm. And um, I really liked him. You know, just having him around as a friend, I felt very comfortable with him. The night that I met Dave, um, we were at, it was like a college dance. And a friend of ours, um, who actually was my friend from from St. Simon's, had been telling me weeks before, you really have to meet this guy. You really have to meet this guy. And it was Dave. He was referring to Dave. So we met that evening, and it just... Uh, you know, turned out that it was a night that my group of friends were planning to go to this river party. Mm -hmm. And it was on the outskirts of town, and we were just going to hang out that night. And I was surprised. I mean, I was just being nice because I had just met Dave. And I said, you want to come? And he said, yes. So I'm thinking, oh, that's so strange that (laughs) that you would come with us. You don't know these people, and I just met you. Yeah. But he came. So he was open. He was fascinated. He was open. And um, he was just so sweet. He was shy. Um, And I thought, well, you know, our friend Brett, our common friend who introduced us, he was coming along too. So I'm thinking, well, if I get bored with him, Brett's here. Mm -hmm. So, um, (laughs) you know, whatever. But we ended up talking the entire night. And um, I think we got home around two or three in the morning, and we left the rest of the group. They were still there. So you dated for a while, and then you decided to get married. Yes. Was it smooth sailing? Um, you know, no. (laughs) The dating wasn't even smooth sailing. I mean, with the two of us, yes. And you expect, you know, little bumps along the way just because you're new to each other. Mm -hmm. Um... And then also with the families, there was some some trouble in the beginning just because I didn't know his family. Um, he knew my family a lot more than I knew his because my parents were pretty much there every other weekend. And you were from dif- different ethnic backgrounds. So he's white, you're Asian. Yes. And so very different for both sides. Very different. And... Um, so, yeah, so there was a lot of that going on. But Just, you got through it. Oh, we sure did. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to dating, one of the things that fascinated me about you is that you actually, when I met you, I thought, oh, she's really, really cool. And then I found out that you've dated a black guy before. <laughs> I did. That was, I was like, I did the happy dance. I said, how is it possible that I find these like-minded people? Because I think I've dated somebody from every continent. Oh, wow. Okay. But that's a life of discovery. You discover who you like and who you want to be with. Exactly. And you ended up with Dave. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I'll let you tell the rest of it over time on your own <laughs> podcast when you're comfortable telling it all. All right. So thank you for joining me. I look forward to launching your podcast and you're going to be amazing. And I can't wait to have you back on at some point because 
those conversations we have in your office on or mine need to be had in front of that's Mike. what i was figuring <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm like thinking now all of those conversations. Oh my goodness. They are great. They are great conversations. People are going to be in for a show. People are going to be so surprised <laughs> because at the end of it all, we are women. We are strong, we are vulnerable, we have weak moments, but all in all, we care. We we are about humanity. So join me next time and look out for Trish is on podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.